Good afternoon. Uh, this um, today, I'm happy to have Bruno de Witte to join us for a talk on separation of powers and the European Council. We are here coming together as the uh, research project SEPA Rope Separation of Powers for 21st Century Europe. And this is uh, one talk in a series of talks in which we try to explore different perspectives on separation of powers in the European Union. This is a cooperation between the Amsterdam, the University of Amsterdam and the University of Helsinki and the University of Gothenburg. And um, it is my particular pleasure to have Bruno de Witte speaking to us. Here he's a professor of European Union law at the Maastricht University and part-time professor at the University uh, European University Institute, and he's joining us today from Florence, from an orange zone of Corona lockdown. And um, as we discussed earlier, it is of course very nice that we are all able to zoom in from the different locations for each and every one of these talks. So let us try to also uh, see the positive side of the current situation. And we are very much looking forward to discussing the role of the European Council within the European Union's separation of powers, if we can speak of that. And without much further ado, I give the screen to Bruno de Witte. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, so um, I'm not going to use slides um, because the problem with slides is that you talk and, and see your own slides. And, and since this is going to be recorded, I prefer to, to watch faces rather than, than slides. So forgive me for that. Um, you said, Christina, the European Council within the EU separation of powers. Now, the general theme of my talk is that it doesn't fit easily within the separation of powers. I would say that the European Council often is situated outside or above the EU's system of separation of powers. That's the general theme of, of my uh, talk today. And as I'm going to refer to the European Council many times in my talk, I will mostly use its little nickname, UCO, um, known from the, the press releases and so on. So I will refer to European Council and UCO um, in turns. Now, what all EU institutions do is to produce words. And sometimes those words lead to action and sometimes even to changes in the real world. Now with the European Council, it doesn't happen very often. The conclusions of its meetings, as we all know, are often verbose. And especially when dealing with external relations, little more than bias wishes very often. And yet the European Council is widely considered, rightly, as one of the most powerful EU institutions. And that is because occasionally its words do lead to important action. The way in which that happens, that translation of these words of the European Council into action is not clearly described in the text of the European treaties. And it could seem problematic from the normative perspective of separation of powers, which is the interest of your project, and from the constitutional law perspective of the principle of institutional balance, which is of course the, like the shadow of the separation of powers in EU law. Now, let me start from a simple point, a simple premise. And that is the, that as an EU institution, UCO, European Council, is bound to respect the institutional balance established by the treaties meaning that it should not encroach on the powers of the other institutions. And this rule is judicially enforceable where the treaties give a formal decision-making power to the European Council. For example, when, when UCO decides um, simplified revisions of the treaties under Article 48, paragraphs 6 and 7, it is bound to respect, you know, the limits of its powers. And this was confirmed by the Pringle judgment of the, in which the Court of Justice accepted to review the legality of the European Council decision amending at the time Article 136 TFEU in order to allow for the creation of the European stability mechanism. And of course, there are other examples 
of formal decisions taken by UCO. For example, this is the institution that proposes a candidate for president of the commission through a formal decision. The UCO also examines measures in the field of EU uh, criminal justice or police cooperation if one or more states have problems with that. So this is a special mechanism foreseen in four articles of the treaty, actually. However, these are exceptional occurrences. UCO's general institutional rule, as described in Article 15 of the TEU, is another one. It is, and I will quote the language which you all know very well, I think, its general role is to provide the union with the necessary impetus for its development and define the general political directions and priorities thereof. And the next sentence adds, it shall not exercise legislative functions. So this priority setting activity mentioned in Article 15 is of course very broad. It, there's no clear boundaries to it. But for sure, it does not take the form of legally binding decisions. The European Council's conclusions typically contain calls for action by others. Whether it's the other is EU institutions or sometimes the member states. And so when doing this, the European Council, I would argue, is acting outside the EU's separation of powers. It sets a political direction, but the necessary legislative or executive action that follows from there must be taken by others. And those others are not bound by the UCO conclusions. And the fact that they are not bound was confirmed. It's, it's logical in the system, but it was confirmed explicitly in a judgment of the Court of Justice in 2018, the case Poland against Parliament and Council where the, the Court of Justice was very explicit in saying that it would never annul a decision adopted by the Council and the Parliament in co-decision because it diverges from conclusions of the European Council. It would never do that. Otherwise, the Court said, the Parliament and the Council's powers would be compromised in favour of following the political will expressed by the European Council. So that's quite clear. The general guidance, the general, you know, impetus given by the European Council in its conclusions does not bind the other institutions and therefore does not interfere, in my view, at least not directly, with the system of separation of powers in EU decision making. However, Article 15 gives only a partial and therefore a distorted picture of the real role played by the European Council. As is argued by um, Luc van Middelaar in his book, Alarms and Excursions, his recent book, the European Council actually play, plays five different roles in the EU's political system, depending on the circumstances. So it acts as strategists, that's the first role, and that's the role which is described in Article 15, the EU. But it also acts as what van Middelaar calls crisis tamer, as impasse breaker, as shaper, and as spokesperson. Now, in some of these other roles, it's more likely to interfere with the EU's institutional balance and separation of powers. It's in these other roles that European Council puts itself, so to speak, above the EU's separation of powers rather than outside it. And that's what I will try to illustrate by looking, by discussing briefly, two examples of European Council activity in the last year, in 2020. The first example is the uh, UCO conclusions of July 2020. Now this, as you may remember, was one of the longest meetings ever in the history of that institution. So at 6 a.m., 6 in the morning on the 21st of July, its president, Michel, tweeted, we did it. And he was 
finally able to end a meeting that had started 90 hours before. The conclusions of that meeting contain a very detailed political agreement on the content of the next generation EU plan, which is of course the name given to the EU's COVID recovery plan, as well as on the multi-annual financial framework for the EU for the seven years to come. So the MFF, multi-annual financial framework for 2021 to 2027. The political agreement took 65 pages of text in those conclusions. Now, the main points of contention during those four days of discussion had not been, you know, all that detailed, but some key issues, such as the overall size of the recovery fund. How much is it going to be? And also the appropriate mix of loans and subsidies within that fund. And so the discussions mainly pitted the frugal states against the others. And what was decisive in political terms for getting to an agreement in the end is that Germany had actually left the alliance of frugal states and that Germany was pushing for the adoption of the package which the Commission had proposed. Now this here, what happened there is can be described as an example of the European Council acting as shaper in the terms used by van Middelaar and also by others actually before him. What they mean is that the European Council plays a key role in deciding, in shaping the big changes in the European integration process. Namely, things like agreeing on revisions of the European treaties or on the accession of new member states. So decisions that shape the nature of the European integration process. Now, I would argue that the July 2020 meeting fits in that category. Although, of course, there were no treaty revisions made there or even discussed. UCO endorsed a new interpretation of some key constitutional norms of EU public finance, which I'm not going to enter into here. But there were some important new interpretations of constitutional law adopted by the European Council. And it gave the green light to what amounts, of course, to a major expansion of the EU budget in order to deal with the COVID crisis. As you may know, the next generation package amounts to 750 billion euros, which is five times as much as the annual EU budget. So in terms of our discussion today, one could wonder whether this Shaper Act of the European Council interfered with the legislative and budgetary powers of the other EU institutions. Now, the first thing to note here is that UCO acted at all in this matter. Indeed, its conclusions dealt with a policy initiative, the next generation EU package that was made by the commission at the end of May. And the commission had presented its policy plans in the form of a series of proposals for legislation. So addressed either to the council or to the parliament and the council together, depending on the legal basis of the different elements in the package. And yet the institution that took decisive action in the first instance, preempting the council and the parliament was the European Council an institution that was not even mentioned in the commission's proposals. So that's the first thing which is really interesting. Same thing with the multi-annual financial framework. The treaties say that it is proposed by the commission and adopted by the council with the consent of the European Parliament. UCO is nowhere mentioned. So with what happened here is that the European Council seized itself of the two files in order to shape the European integration process. If you then look at the actual content of those conclusions, those 65 pages, they are also quite remarkable. First of all, by the way in which they set out in great detail, including by means of tables containing precise financial amounts, the content of the next generation EU package and of the multi-annual financial framework. 
And secondly, by the peremptory way in which this happens. If you read the conclusions, you will see that they are full of the verbs will and shall. It's all the time about the Union, European Union will do this and shall do this, indicating that the European Council considered that it could decide what the Union was going to do through the Next Generation Program and through the MFF. No words were spent on even a polite reminder that the formal adoption of this political agreement would require action by the other EU institutions. So if you just read the conclusions, you would have thought, okay, that's it, you know, it's decided. But of course it wasn't. So what do we make of this in the light of the little sentence in Article 15 TEU that the, e the European Council shall not exercise legislative functions? I guess it depends on what we understand by those words. In those 65 pages, the UCO did something that looks very much like legislative drafting, you know, because of the detail of it. But the formal adoption of the various elements of the package still had to happen afterwards, according to the procedures set out in the various legal bases. And in fact, the remaining five months of the year 2020 were then spent on fine tuning the July agreement within the Council and negotiating its content with the European Parliament, which had co decision or consent powers for major elements of the package. So the European Council conclusions of July were not the final word on the recovery plan and on the MFF. And the European Parliament managed to force through a number of changes to the package, although not on the essential points, for the simple reason that the Parliament agreed with the essential points of the package. Now then, during the final stages of these negotiations, a major political incident occurred, which you've all heard of, of course, namely when the governments of Hungary and Poland threatened to veto the whole package, which they could, unless one element of the uh, MFF were to be removed from it, namely the regulation establishing a general conditionality for the use of EU funds, the famous rule of law regulation which had been presented by the Commission as part of the multiannual financial framework package. Now, as the adoption of that regulation was subject to co-decision because of its legal basis, the Parliament had managed during the trilogue to strengthen somewhat the rule of law conditionality compared to what had been written in the European Council conclusions of July, which were not very explicit about this. And Hungary and Poland were unhappy with that. And so at the European Council meeting of December, of the 10th and the 11th of December, you had again very difficult discussions. And eventually a compromise was found and expressed in the conclusions of the European Council. What the conclusions sought to do is to sort of tweak the meaning or the significance of the conditionality regulation so as to make it more acceptable to Hungary and Poland. And this then paved the way indeed for the adoption of the multi-annual financial framework and the various elements of the recovery package, which these two countries had threatened to veto. So what the UCO did here is to perform, in my view, another of Van Middelaar's five functions, namely to act as impasse breaker. The other institutions had reached a dead end in the deliberations. There was the distinct possibility that the whole recovery plan would fail because of this. And so intervention by the heads, by the heads of government, appeared like the only way to break the impasse, to solve the problem. Now the question then is whether this impasse breaker act of the European Council constituted a massive interference with the institutional balance, as some commentators have argued after the meeting. For example, there was a very forceful blog post by Alemanno and Chamon 
the next day, you know, in Verfassungsblock of the 11th of December, which was entitled, to save the rule of law, you must apparently break it, referring to what European Council had done. So what they and others have argued is that the European Council had legislative, executive, and judicial power all at the same time. The alleged interference with the legislative power was that Yuko had added this lengthy gloss interpretative statement to the text of the regulation as it had been negotiated and as it was then adopted shortly afterwards. The alleged interference with the executive power is that the Yuko conclusion stated that the Commission would adopt guidelines on how to apply the regulation, something in which the text of the regulation did not foresee, and that the Commission would adopt those guidelines only after the Court of Justice will decide the action for annulment of this rule of law regulation that Hungary and Poland would introduce, and which they have introduced in the meantime. And then, of course, the alleged interference with the judicial power was that Yuko, in this way, was trying to give some kind of suspensive effect to an action for an element, namely the one brought by Hungary and Poland, something which, of course, is not foreseen in the court's statutes or rules of procedure. So several commentators, upset by this watering down of the Union's rule of law policy, encouraged the Parliament the European Parliament to bring an action for annulment of the UCO conclusions, you know, of the conclusions of the European Council for breach of the principle of institutional balance. This would have raised interesting issues of admissibility, since the question could then arise whether the conclusions of the European Council are a reviewable act in the sense of Article 263. However, the Parliament explicitly refused to go along that route. In a resolution which the Parliament adopted on the 17th of December, one week after the UCO meeting and one day after the rule of law regulation had been effectively adopted, which is interesting, so they waited for the formal adoption of the rule of law regulation. And then the Parliament adopted this regulation in which it's stated dryly, that the content of the European Council conclusions on this regulation is superfluous, the Parliament said. The applicability, purpose and scope of the rule of law regulation is clearly defined in the legal text of the said regulation. And any political declaration by the European Council cannot be deemed to represent an interpretation of legislation, as interpretation is vested with the Court of Justice. That's what the Parliament said. It considered that the UCO, the European Council, simply could not have infringed its legislative power by means of its political conclusions. Now, on the alleged infringement of the Commission's executive power, that's of course a different story, because the argument here is that the Commission could not freely act as guardian of compliance with EU law because of the European Council's conclusions. Since the conclusion said the Commission will first adopt guidelines and they will not take action under the rule of law regulation until the court has decided. But if you look at the language used in the European Council conclusions, the language said the Commission intends to develop guidelines. And until these guidelines are finalized, the Commission will not propose measures under the regulation. In other words, the Commission accepted to do this, not because it was ordered to do this by the European Council, but out of its free political will, which apparently was conveyed by the President of the Commission, who, as we know, is a member of the European Council. In fact, more generally, one can say that the membership of the Commission President means that the Commission should not be understood as a political rival of the European Council, but most of the time as one of its allies. Now, in this particular controversy, I tend to agree with the accommodating position taken by both the Parliament and the Commission, 
and I disagree with the critical blog posts. On the substance of the controversy, I think it was important to save the adoption of the recovery plan and the multivennial financial framework, even at the cost of a temporary limitation in the application of the new rule of law instrument. And on the question of constitutional principle, I do not think there was a breach of the institutional balance here. Now, what is clear from these two episodes, you know, these two uh, things that happened last year, but also from some earlier episodes during the Euro crisis, which have been discussed a lot in the literature, is that the European Council occasionally puts itself above the other institutions, you know? It's the top dog in its own view. It seizes the initiative to break an impasse or to shape a major new development in EU policies. And it does so outside the normal operation of the EU's decision-making system. It is a forum for building consensus about you know, the medium or long-term path of EU integration, but it's more than that. It's also a pivotal decision-making institution which directly intervenes in governing areas of EU activity. Now, this protagonist role, in my view, reflects the fact that the European Union is still, in many ways, a creature of its member states. And those member states have insisted on unanimity and on single country vetoes all over the place. You know, for a large number of important policy decisions, you need unanimity and you have single country vetoes. Now, given this institutional rigidity, which I deplore, which I find terrible, but given that it exists, the union needs the direct involvement of the collective heads of government to take matters forward on crucial occasions. After which the normal institutional balance designed, designed by the treaties can then take its course again. So to conclude, I don't think that what we see here is an ideal situation from a separation of powers perspective, but it does reflect the fact that the European Union is not a nation state, not a federal state, but rather an advanced international organization in which the political authority of the heads of national governments is needed and is needed regularly to keep the system working for the benefit both of the member states, but also of us all, of the citizens. Thanks, thank you very much.